Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing my analysis into aesthetics. I'm using two books for the lecture series. The first is this book, which I've hyperlinked on the first video uh, installment, hyperlinked directly to Amazon for this book. The second is this book. So um, today we're going to be using this book. We're going to be looking at Heidegger's notion of aesthetics. It's a rather dense, it's an extremely dense uh, chapter. It's probably going to take me several hours. We're approaching, I think, four or five hours now into the lecture series, and I'm still on the chapter on Heidegger. I didn't think it would be this in-depth, but I wanted to give a very systematic um, analysis of Heidegger's account of aesthetics, and it's and it's Heidegger. It's very, very difficult read. It's an incredibly difficult read. Uh, yesterday I spent uh, I spent probably about two hours on one page, now in all seriousness, just to try and have an understanding of what he was saying. It's a I wouldn't go as far as saying frustrating, because I like I I like difficult things, and I love philosophy. Uh, the problem with Heidegger, however, is that his 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 ideas, his thought process is so abstract that it becomes very, very difficult to make any type of coherence out of what he's saying. I do want to do justice to Heidegger's account of the aesthetics, though, because I think it's extremely important, extremely critical to a contemporary discourse on aesthetics. And hopefully what I'll do today is I'll be able to give his concept some justice. As you guys know, um, the lecture series is always available for you to download my notes, so just click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF document. I just updated it um, yesterday. So, I mean, I shouldn't say it like that because this video will be up hopefully in 20 years or so. Speaking of being up, now today is a very, today is a very, very important day. The Venus transition is going to happen in a, in a few hours, which is, you know, that can factor into the apocalyptic worldview, blah, blah, blah. It's something, it's an event that only happens um, once in a lifetime, really. So I am very, I'm proud to be doing this aesthetics lecture series during the uh, the, the time of on the day of the Venus transition. That has nothing to do with the lecture series at all. I just thought I'd throw that out there. But um, again, we're going to be looking at the origin of the work of art in Martin Heidegger. Again, as I said, my lecture series, the videos, the notes are always a supplement to your own reading. Make sure you get the books. Make sure you do the reading for yourself. It'll help. Uh, It'll help enlighten your understanding of aesthetics. And I have to admit, it's very, very, it's dense, it's dense. As far as pre um, preparation for the lecture series, undeniably this has been, for me, the most difficult series to compile. Not because I don't know aesthetics, but because Heidegger and his writing is so, it's so incredibly abstract. It's so incredibly abstract. And I'm a philosopher, I'm accustomed to abstract, but it's his, his level of abstraction is on another, on another, another level. Okay, enough chit chat. Let's get started. So this is aesthetics. Get another marker. And this is uh, section 1.2 of my notes, and we're at the top of page four. Section 1.2. understand the thingly, remember we talked about the thingly element, right? The thingly element within art. And just to re refresh your memory as to what that was, I just discussed that um, in the last section. But the idea is we recognize the relationship between the artist and the artist's work. The artist produces work, and insofar as the artist produces a work of art, that work of art is a representation um, not only of the mastery of the artist, if the artist is sufficiently skilled, but it is, it, it's also a representation of this thingly element. There's an element of art, whatever that is, which we still don't know yet. There's an element of art in the work of art. And I showed you the picture that I commissioned Rare Art to draw for me in the last, or to paint for me rather, in the last section. There's something um, in that work that quote unquote speaks to the, to the viewer, right? So that the viewer sees, perceives, the artwork, and it's not just the mere material 
aspect of the art. It's not the particular type of paint, it's not the color, it's not the arrangement of geometrical figures, it's that it speaks to the individual. This is the thingly element that we are attempting to identify. So, a, a bit conceptually broad, of course, again, being Heidegger, it's extremely broad, but we're going to try, again, to make more sense of what this thingly element is. So, he notes, quote, on the whole, the word thing here designates, that's important, right, the word thing here designates whatever is not simply nothing. So, by talking about a thing, we recognize that we're talking about all those things which are not nothing, right? Again, abstract, but rather simple if you think about it. By the use of the term thing, we are designating those things which actually do exist, which are something, rather than those things which don't exist, which are nothing. In this sense, the work of art is also a thing. Well, rather obviously, okay. So far as it is some sort, some sort of being. Okay, so the distinction between those things that are something, those things that are nothing, those things that are something are things, of the things that are things, art is one of those things. I'm channeling Heidegger right now, right? I think Heidegger would approve of, of uh, that very abstract uh, sort of conceptualization. So, before we go to, well actually I'll, I'll draw this now because I'm going to draw the picture and then I'm going to explain it. So, as I've done in my lecture series on semiotics, and it's funny how many times I refer back to this lecture series, but we have the relationship between the signified and the signifier. And then we have a corresponding relationship between the thing and the trait. So, signifier, signified, thing, I mean traits, things. I'm not going to go into a, and I should have put a hyperlink to my, and actually I'll remember, remind myself to go back and hyperlink to the semiotics. Link to, I'll provide a link to my semiotics lecture, but I've already um, done a, a very in-depth lecture on, on semiot semiotics and so sore, and the idea is just super general, super quick. The signified is a concept for, for all practical purposes. The the signified ED is a concept. The signifier is a trigger, if you will. It's a word, a phrase, um, it's it's an utterance, it's mental conceptions, or mental mental um, mental ways, modes of thinking that lead us towards the 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 thought, lead us towards the to the uh, concept. Granted, it's way more abstract than that. It's way more complex, way more general. So sort of makes you know accommodations so that it doesn't have to actually be physiological utterances and so on and so forth. Locke calls it sound patterns. It, you can describe it in terms of signal and signification. None of that really matters. Um, but what we recognize is that the signifier triggers, right? It sends us. There's there's there is uh, a physiological. Um, response to sense data in the world, that sense data could be sound, sight, images, icons, what have you, and it leads us, it directs us, it triggers us to a more abstract, overarching thought, concept, roughly speaking. That's sort of the same relationship between the trait, which serves as a trigger, as a means of directing the individual perceiver, the artist, the thinker, towards the thing. Okay, again, as I said, very, very abstract. Um, and it might be very difficult to understand how this relates to art at all. Uh, and it's not the case that all artists are themselves aware of this, but um, read what Heidegger has said, and then we'll, we'll deconstruct the significance of this. So, the traits signify something proper to the thing itself. The traits signify something proper to the thing itself. They are they are its properties, right? So the traits are the thing's properties, is a way of saying it. It's a simple way of saying that. The traits are the thing's properties. A thing is that around which the properties have assembled, right? So in terms of discussing a thing, in order for us to make sense of a thing, a thing is 
a thing exists insofar as 